we're, we're going to have everyone to introduce themselves and tell us where, where you're calling from uh, today. First of all, my name is Bill Sultan, Atlanta, Georgia, via California. William Safir, Atlanta, Georgia. Abdul. Well, Brooklyn. Abdul, Brooklyn, New York. Alhamdulillah. Well, you New York here. House. Yeah. Who's next? What are you doing here? Okay. Allah. Brother Safir. Atlanta, Georgia. Can you hear me? Yes, sir. I hear you. Alhamdulillah. I see someone else on. Who is the call again? Naima from Brooklyn. Alhamdulillah. You drive. Salaam alaikum. Yaziki Abdullah from Atlanta, Georgia. Alhamdulillah. Hey. Assalamu alaikum. Kareem Abdul Salaam, Memphis, Tennessee. Yeah. Well, Daoud Sharif, Daoud Wali in Atlanta. All right, Atlanta's really in the house. <laughs> Next, who else is coming? Who else is on? Anyone else sign in? Introduce yourself and tell us where you're calling from. Shafika Abdullah from Atlanta. Alhamdulillah, you know, instructor said this is going to be a short, a short class tonight. He ain't bringing no grease, no water. He's bringing all meat. So he's getting right, right to the point. So we have to have, to have a lot of time to think about it. It's a blessing to be here. Yeah, Alhamdulillah. Always is. Who else is online? Who else calling in? Here's the name. Where you calling from? I, I can't see you, Kamal, and your mic's gone off. Uh -huh. Thank you. Let me fix this. There was someone I just saw that they introduced themselves. Introduce yourself, uh, Nazaka. Hey. Oh, uh, my, name, my, my name is Nazaka, or Nazakat. I'm calling from the UK, Bradford, West Yorkshire. Uh -huh. Thank you. Alhamdulillah. Thanks for calling in. So UK is in the house. Uh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> Yorkshire has <laughs> been represented. <laughs> yes. We're world, worldwide. We're worldwide. You are international. Assalamualaikum. Waalaikumsalam. Ramzi, I mean, Columbia, South Carolina. Alhamdulillah. Alhamdulillah. Yeah, I'm South Carolina. I'm something to South Carolina. You're in the home state. All right. Yes. right. <laughs> we got connect. We got connect, bro. Yeah. All, right. so all by means. Yes, Who else sir. is calling in? Assalamualaikum. Waalaikumsalam. Yeah. Alhamdulillah. Welcome. Next caller. Salam alaikum. We're known in Majid, Southern California. Alhamdulillah. California's in the house. <laughs> yes, indeed. Salam, salam alaikum. Wa alaikum salam. Executive <laughs> instructor Imam Adib Abdullah out of Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, in the house. Wow. Uh -huh. All right. Bring them. Oh. Yes. Yes. Alhamdulillah. Assalamu alaikum. This is the uh, Kamal and Shifa from the East Coast, Rhode Island. Rhode Island. Uh, United alhamdulillah. States. Originally yeah. from the UK. Yeah. Okay. All right. All right. <laughs> oh, boy. <laughs> we can't take over Atlanta, Georgia. We got to make sure we get more on from Atlanta. That's they right. Coming for us. Who else is in the house? Yeah, yeah, can you hear me? Yeah, I can't, can't, can't understand you. Yeah, All right. Alhamdulillah. Anyone else calling in? Assalamualaikum. This is Sister Nevada. I'm calling in from New Orleans. Oh, New Orleans in the house. All right. Alhamdulillah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. <laughs> We we're waiting on New Orleans, John. We can stop for New Orleans, John. <laughs> yes, who else is in the house? And you know, it's a blessing that we can be all in the same house at one time from all over the world. That that is a um, I said living in the best times and the worst times at the same time. Alhamdulillah, alhamdulillah. But this is beautiful that we able to connect like this and be able to be able to see and talk to each other as if we sitting right in the same same room. That is, a, that is an outright blessing. Anyone else? Well, we have a name called Universal. You, all right. 
Never, we never had this good before, really. The world has never been connected like it is connected right now. Mm -hmm. And we, we part of that connection. This technology is awesome. I'm telling you. That's why I say it's the best time, the worst time, it's the same time. It all depends on how you use it. You can mm -hmm. give life to our life with what we're on right now. We need a new people for the digital age. Yeah, I'm good enough. <laughs> yes. Anyone else in the house? Had to introduce themselves. Greetings. This is Instructor Benjamin Bilal, and we'll be beginning in about two minutes. So, Khalil, if you can give your wrap up, this would be the time. All right. Well, Alhamdulillah, thank you for allowing me to uh, talk to our learners today for a couple of minutes. I was uh, talking to some uh, friends and family, and they asked me, Khalil, why is it you? Why nothing in the valley you uh, called you to get out of Khalil, hold on one moment. We need for everyone else to mute their phones so that we can hear Khalil clearly, please. Just mute your phones. So I, I I'm, my... I'm going to mute. I'm going to mute it for you, Khalil. Just mute, mute yourself back in, okay? Uh, Khalil, mute yourself back in. You're not. Okay. Muted. There you go. Okay, Khalil. I got it. So they had they had a question for me. They said, "Well, and, and it, it was Muslims and as well as uh, you know uh, people who who are." Uh, Columns who are uh, adhere to the uh, religion of Christianity and still and and uh, and another faith, so they wanted to know what kept kept me so peaceful. I said, "Well, I try to live life the way I want life to be lived. I was keeping life alive, and I I have a little poem that I wrote on that particular thing. Gonna take but a minute, and it says, "It is me." that need to show and give love before looking for it. It is me that need to get better every day. It is me learning how to control me. It is me need to study before I study you. It is me that need to know God before I share him with you. It is me that need to be more compassionate, forgiving, charitable, and loving to humanity and God's creation. It is me that need to find my faults in me rather than looking for faults in you. It is me that need to smile before looking for a smile from you. It is me that need to be a better son, husband, father, grandfather, great-grandfather, brother, uncle, cousin, nephew, and friend before I expect it from you. It is me that need to pray before I ask you to pray for me. It is me that need to give respect before looking for respect. It is me that need to be honorable before I expect honor from you. It is me that need to look in the mirror of my heart and soul to make sure they're in check. It is me to love, to live the sermon before I preach it to you. Keeping life alive, Khalil Sultan. And so that I tell them that's the way, that's the way we live. So alhamdulillah, if we, if we keep working on doing the best thing we can for, for life and for humanity and for ourselves, then we will have the best life that we could ever live, and we will be at peace all the time. So my soul is at peace, and alhamdulillah, I try to do something every day to keep it at peace. <laughs> alhamdulillah. Thank you, brother, the instructor. Yes, sir, and it is my pleasure. Salam alaikum to you and to the rest of our listening audience. Thank you all for being with us on this uh, sixth night of November 2022. I am your international instructor, Benjamin Bilal, getting over just a little bit of a head cold. Nothing to worry about. As long as this stays intact, this voice box right here, we're going to have a class. All right. So I greet you all in the greetings of peace that obligate each and every one of us to keep the peace. That is salamu alaykum. Wa alaykum salam. And uh, those who may be joining us for the first or second time, you need to know that this word salam, which is an all important word in the Quran, represents not only the idea of uh, peace, P-E-A-C-E, -E, but it also represents the idea of that which has, or I should say that which is in the process of completing itself. That which is in the process of making itself 
whole. And uh, the best example of that is just to look at the waxing and waning of the moon, for instance, where it begins as a thin crescent in the sky, and it moves progressively night by night to increase its property. And the effort in increasing that property will bring it eventually to a half moon, as we know, and then eventually by the end of the month to a full moon. And it's the full moon that was actually the objective of the crescent. So we're not just to remain piecemeal. We're not just to remain crescent Muslims. You get what I'm saying? We're not just to remain star and crescent Muslims. <laughs> just glimmering a section of what the Quran represents. You know, some of us are glimmering that section in our thawb, in our some nechimar, or what they call a hijab or whatever, you know. Those are just bits and piecemeals of what you're referring to as Islam. When in fact the Quran gives us our deen in the name Al-Islam, which is comprehensive. See, it's not piecemeal. So when we greet each other with peace, P-E-A-C-E, -E, we should understand also that we're greeting each other with our P-I-E-C-E. -E. In other words, our piece of the puzzle. And when you as a Muslim bring your piece of the puzzle to the international picture of what a Muslim is supposed to be, then ethnicity ceases to be an issue. Nationality, even language differentiation cease to be a real issue for how we are to communicate and grow as an ummah. We're supposed to bring our Indonesian peace. We're supposed to bring our Bangladeshian peace. We're supposed to bring our Saudi peace. We're supposed to bring our Senegalese peace. We're supposed to bring our British peace. All of us have a P-I-E-C-E -E of the puzzle to bring in order for the collective to grow into the P-E-A-C-E -E that Salam truly represents. I like the way I said that. <laughs> that was all right. So that's how Allah inspires us. You know, this is not academic in the sense that we've become used to academia. Words on the blackboard and that kind of thing. This is really uh, an exercise in how people are truly inspired by the source creator. Give me just one moment. My cursor is starting to curse at me. I have to make sure that I'm controlling it and not some wayward somebody in cyberspace. That can happen also. Give me just one moment. Okay, still admitting people. So I'm giving just another minute or two before getting into the crux of the information for tonight. It's going to be absolutely wonderful what you're going to learn tonight, inshallah. Once I begin officially, which I'm about to do, then I'm going to have about 60 minutes to make my points and close out, inshallah. Okay, so just bear with me. I just want to make sure that everything is working properly here. Could be the battery in my mouse, I'm not sure. It could be some mice snuck into my system, you know, trying to take it over. This has never happened, but give me a, give me a moment anyway. It's all good, as they say. Allah is in control, always. And if you do have any questions along the way, simply put them into the chat box. We will not be opening up for verbal questions today. We don't have enough time to do that. But in the event I don't get to answer your questions before tonight's session is over, I will surely send you an answer via email. I get all of the comments in an email shortly thereafter. OK, so I think we're ready to get started. Let me pull up my notes. And uh, tonight's discourse is somewhat of an extension of last week's comments regarding uh, Imam W. Dean Muhammad and many of the things that he actually uh, delivered to us as language and logic. I like to focus not on his flesh or not on his, you know, the phenomenon of him being born into the world. No, he's not a Christ. He's just a human being like us. But Allah gifted him with a particular level of language and logic that was intended, I believe, to not only help us grow as so-called African-American people, uh, but also to help humanity grow, not just Muslims, but humanity. 
The Quran was not birthed into the world in order to service just a particular ethnic group or a particular nationality or a particular language group. The Quran was birthed into the world to service the growth and development and evolution of the human type. So that's what we're going to begin talking about tonight. You have entered the portals of the University Online Learning Course on this Sunday, November 6, 2022. Once again, I am your international instructor, Benjamin Bilal, also known as Imam Benjamin Bilal, but I reserve that title for when I'm at the master of taking care of serious business. <laughs> when I'm out here trying to deal with the issues of what people need to know in order to grow their human selves, then I am the instructor, giving internal structure to those who listen, inshallah. Now, in the development from crude to sophisticated human, sophisticated human, there are essentially four stages. Those four stages are number one, instinctive man. In the Quran, it's given in the term ins. Now, before those of you who know Arabic out the kazoo begin saying, that ain't what that means, up. Huh? Just bear with me, get used to a shift in paradigms, linguistic paradigms. Maybe perchance you have missed something. So let's begin this numerical journey again. Number one, instinctive man. In the Quran, I want you to reference wherever Allah has chosen to use the word ins. Number two, we're talking about baseline intuitive man. When I say baseline, I'm talking about the intuition that every human being is actually born with when they exit from their mother's abdomen. Baseline intuition. Babies know things without you having taught those things to them, but it's not 100% foolproof what they know, or I should say what they're feeling. So sometimes a person might walk into the room and the baby might just start crying. And when the person leaves, the baby stops crying and the person walks back in, the baby starts crying. I had a niece like that who just couldn't stand to see my presence when she was an infant. She thought, I went to that. And I felt as guilty as I don't know what, but for no reason, because she don't know me. <laughs> Y'all know what I'm talking about. But that was her intuition. Allah gave the human baby that level of intuition so that some of the major dangers that might be lurking in the background of that baby's spirituality would be at least recognized and responded to. But that's baseline. You can't build a world off of baseline intuition. But that is in the Quran under the term anas, nas. That's number two. Then we have number three, where the human being, evolutionarily speaking, grows into what is called the moral thinking man. Once your mind becomes moral, it becomes judgmental. And in order to make proper judgments, the mind has to be able to think. In fact, the English word thinker comes from the Quranic Arabic word dhikr and dhakr. Which is the thinking process. So you're going to be amazed at how many English words you've been using practically all of your life actually come out of the Quran from people who understood those connections, but felt just a little bit shy of sharing that information with common people. But many of the scholars know it in the Christian world, many of them know it. In the Jewish world, many of them know that. I'm talking about, about the Quran. And in the Muslim world, it's uh, unfortunate that the majority of Muslims have not been taught that by their ulima and their sheikhs and their shakers and you know the people who run the ship uh, on the linguistic and scholarly level. But it doesn't matter at this point. Allah has given it to just common me and you, you know, common Joe and, uh, and you know, Jenna, <laughs> common Yusuf, you have it now, all right? So that's number three, the moral thinking man, and it's under the term insan, 
So when you read in the Quran, for instance, where Allah says, uh, that certainly, or as we would say in the hood, for show, sure, for show, sure, that means ain't no doubt about this. Allah, or we in this case, Allah as the leading influence over the forces in nature. We have certainly created the human being, al insan, fi asani taqweem. You hear that release? Fi asani taqweem. That's the superlative word for excellence, being excellent in practically all that you do. It says that Allah created us in the most excellent of organizational designs, taqweem, qama. All of these words, which means that you are establishing a standard of behavior. See, some say that means to stand, right? Iqama means to stand. Well, taqawim being from that same root, uh, root means to stand also, but to stand as a standard. See, a standard, establishing standards. And if you're not establishing standards, then it's clear that you're not a moral thinking person. Because it's only the moral mind making judgments about what's right and wrong, what's good and bad, what's clean and filthy, and then separating out all of the lesser stuff in order to advance the superior stuff. Hmm? Yeah, it's only that type of mind, that type of thinking that's going to be considered excellent in the world. Everything else really can be relegated to what the average animal does for survival's sake. But when you become a moral person, thinking person based on a decency standard of what is good and bad decency wise, not politically, we're not talking about moral majority politics, we're talking about the truest meaning for moral, which means that the mind has become like the ocean in this regard, where the ocean churns and it can be a turbulent ride, but the turbulence is designed to do what? To take everything in that ocean that is not part and parcel of the ocean and send it off to the shore. And everything I just told you is in the Quran, in other words, where Allah says that he leaves on the shore what we call scum, the scum. He leaves that, you know, he leaves that with the sands of the shore and then some seashells, you know, some relics. But that which is good for humanity, Allah says, he sends it back out into the ocean. Isn't that wonderful? Yeah, it's talking about human behavior. It's talking about the nature in human beings to share the goods, like those ships are sharing the goods. Hmm? Importing, exporting, but importing and exporting human excellence is what it's referring to first and foremost. So that's number three, the moral thinking man, insana created fi asani taqwim. And then lastly is a level that you, I'm sure have not heard addressed in this particular fashion, nor would I guess that you've heard this particular level of human beings even discussed even amongst the academicians of this world. And that is the supra intuitive man. Let me say that again, the supra. You wanna know where the real Superman is, is right here. It's in your supra-intuitive mind or abilities. And uh, many of the metaphysicians connect this level of thinking with what the scientists call your pineal gland, P-I-N-E-A-L, the pineal gland. It sits square in the center of your brain. And it's actually, the only part of the human brain that is not divided into halves. Hmm? The brain normally has its right hemisphere, its left hemisphere, and every other part of the brain is divided into halves. And the brain is even divided into quarters. But this particular part that we're calling the pineal gland is no bigger than a P, <laughs> a P-E-A. It's no bigger than a P, all right? And it sits right in the middle. Now, the interesting thing about this particular gland. Pat, Pat, that's enough. Okay, I have to mute people along the way. Even the dogs want to learn new netics. Isn't that wonderful? <laughs> All right. 
So the very, very interesting thing about the pineal gland is that it was created by Allah and there are some scientists now who say that it's a vestigial gland, meaning that it used to serve some purpose in human history, but you know, since man became so sophisticated now because of the rational mind, you know, we can figure that out for ourselves. We don't need any supra intuitive help from that part of the brain anymore. So they dismiss that part of the brain and they say that it has since become calcified. And you can see pictures of that. If you Google pineal gland or calcified pineal gland, you'll see pictures of it. But the truth is, is that the pineal gland becomes calcified due to our non-use of it, number one. Number two, many of the social conspirators have chosen to put calcium deposits and uh, all kinds of things in our water, our drinking water, as well as in our toothpaste. And that has been the major cause of the calcification of the pineal gland. Other than that, human beings would be assisted to this day with a supra-intuitive power that Allah created to be able to become activated in the brain that would take a lot of the pressure off of the rational mind. Because Allah would be giving you what's called the cosmic connections to the cosmos itself, where there's all kinds of information, infinite information. And there are people to this day, at this time, who know how to tap into that cosmic realm of information. Sometimes it'll happen during a dream. In fact, in history, it has happened for each and every person that we now consider, scripturally speaking, to have been a prophet, P-R-O-P-H-E-T. And the reason why they P-R-O-F-I-T is because Allah has allowed them to tap, in, to tap into cosmic frequencies. And if you don't think that the Quran is a book of cosmic frequencies, then you're in the wrong class. Because the Quran is nothing but cosmically based frequencies. The Quran, by that name, is a book of sound more than it is a book of sight. The book of sight that you read pages off of, that's called the Mus'haf, the book where you're supposed to pay meticulous attention with your ears, is called Al-Quran. I hope I'm stirring, I hope I'm, I'm shaking up some, some, some cells. I hope some synapses are starting to come together so that you can remember all of this. This is important information. So that's the supra-intuitive man, the one who has had his pineal gland, her pineal gland, their pineal gland, to be politically correct, activated. We'll talk about that in a moment. In the Quran, it's given to you as bashir. See, a lot of these words that have been given to you in simplified form as though they really don't mean that much and they're really probably all saying the same thing. It's just talking about human beings. No, it's not. In fact, in the English speaking world, the word a human has been given to us in its full form and definition. And we'll talk about that in a moment also. Boy, we're letting people in here like it's whew, <laughs> the last day on earth. You remember that movie? All right. Well, this for many is the first day on earth because it's the first opportunity for them to think free of the social and linguistic manipulators. Let's continue. Let's just recap these four. Number one, instinctive man. Number two, baseline intuitive man. Number three, the moral thinking man. And number four, the supra intuitive man. And by man, I'm sure you know by now that man means mind. It has nothing to do with gender. That's why she has man in her title, woman. She's the womb out of which each mind comes forth, womb of man. Allah says in the 18th surah, 110th ayah, قُلْ إِنَّمَا أَنَا بَشَّرٌ مِثْلُكُمْ يُوهَا إِلَيَّ أَنَّمَا إِلَّهُكُمْ إِلَّهٌ وَاحِدٌ فَمَنْ كَانَ يَرْجُوْ لِقَاءَ رَبِّهِ فَلْيَعْمَلْ عَمَلًا صَالِحًا وَلَا يُشْرِكْ بِإِبَادَةِ Pardon me, بِإِبَادَةِ رَبِّهِ أَحَدًا Translated into English by Yusuf Ali, say, I am but a man like yourselves. This is where the word Basharun or Bashar is being used. 
that man we just got finished talking about who's in touch with his supra intuitive possibilities via the pineal gland. Don't worry about the science just catch the theme of what I'm saying. I am a man, a basher, just like yourselves. And then Yusuf, for whatever reason, he inserts the word, but in brackets, but there's no but in the Arabic. So keep that in mind. But meaning, however, the inspiration has come to me that your Allah is one Allah. Whoever expects to meet his Lord, let him work righteousness and in the worship of his Lord, admit no one as partner. End quote. Now, let me just point out a couple of very serious errors that are being made here in the translation. So where Allah says, Yes, it's saying that the prophet should tell the people, say, and by the way, the Arabic word Qul is a combination of the consonants Qaf and Lam. Qaf and Lam. Qaf represents the back of the head where the subconscious mind resides and all of the emotional stuff resides, the back of the head, all right? And then there's the lamb. Lamb, as a part of your anatomy, is your tongue, your tongue. So kul means to bring something from the back of the head, meaning where the subconscious mind is, where all of that information you've been learning since day one has been stored as memory in what's called the memory bank, the back of the head. And it's to move that information forward until it can be expressed from the tongue. See, so off lamb say, because you can't say anything unless you've already captured these words in your subconscious mind. You can't just pull sounds out of the air. You had to have learned these. And another meaning for the letter lamb is learning. It means to teach, but it also means to learn in the same way that your tongue speaks, but the tongue also takes in food. And that food is information going into the body, see? So when you begin to learn this process that we call nunetics, meaning the learning of the Arabic language, not word for word, not root word for root word, but letter for letter. When you understand that each letter has its own unique and distinct meaning, then when you group letters together, one letter with a second letter with a third letter, you don't only have a word, you actually have a sentence. You see how this goes? So imagine now being able to read your Quran unlike the rest of even the Muslim world. They're reading word for word. You're seeing every word, every letter, pardon me, as already being a word. So when you group words together, you have a sentence. So that root word that you thought was just a root word with no other meaning but what the root word tells you, it's telling you many more things other than kitab. Kataba book. Qara'a, <laughs> read. It's telling you much more than that because each one of those letters is already a word. See? That's the beauty of nunetics. And Allah gave it to people who look like you and me when we look at ourselves in the mirror every morning. That's a mercy, but it's not a guarantee. <laughs> so don't play it for granted. The black man is the superior man, man. Get out of my class with that foolishness. The righteous man is the superior man. And you can take that to the bank. The person who obeys his rabba is the superior mind in this earth right now. Has always been, but it's expressing itself more and more now. Let's continue. So... All right, you have from the same root as the word wahi, which is the inspiration, the inspiration, the wahi. So what is being said here? In the Quran, through the mouth of our prophet Muhammad, he's telling the people that I am a bashar, like all of you, all of you who are humans, you share this possibility. You share this property and this possibility. Doesn't mean you are all at this stage of human development yet, but it's a possibility for your nature is what's being said here. And then it says, the inspiration has come to me, but there's no but. I don't know what Yusuf Ali was thinking. There's no word here that says, well, 
you are on this side of the fence, humans, and I'm like you on this side of the fence, but you are not people capable of receiving why. So I'm on the other side of the fence. I'm special, like they say Jesus was special. You understand? That's not what the Quran is saying. The Quran actually comes to level the playing field when it comes to what a true human is and what the possibilities for human growth and development are. So what Allah is actually saying is that he's giving instructions to Muhammad the prophet to tell the people that I am a mortal. I am a human flesh and blood being like all of you. And then he just goes straight into saying that the inspiration, the wahi has come to me. And what is that wahi? That your Allah is one Allah, but that's not what that's saying. Do you see the word? I'll, I'll let you look at the transliteration. Do you see the word Allah here anywhere being transliterated? Anywhere? No. So why does he say without putting it in brackets that your Allah is one Allah? No, it says, Now, if you don't know what ilahun means, as differentiated from what Allah means, then you're never going to understand what's being said here. We're not going to go into that today. That's just something to wet your whistle and make you think, and wow, what does it Let me go ask my sheikh and my shakers when I go to the masjid next Friday. What does ilah mean? Especially in light of the fact that the declaration we take says la ilaha illallah, that there is no ilah. There's only Allah. I know what they told you. There's no God except Allah. No, la ilaha means there is no ilah. <laughs> there is no ilah. This thing you're calling ilah, there is none. Illallah. There's only Allah. Now, I've given some classes on that, so you should understand it by now. All right. And if not, we'll revisit that in a couple of weeks. Just food for thought that I'm throwing out there tonight. I have to keep it capsulized for tonight. And of course, whoever expects to meet his rub, meaning what? The one who is responsible for not only creating you, but evolving and sustaining your evolution. That's rub. What a weak translation when they put the word Lord. You know, I mean, people in England call themselves lords. In America, they call themselves landlords. I mean, that's not such a big word now that they've sullied it and bandied it, bandied it about, you know, and attached it to other concepts that have nothing to do with the one who is responsible for creating us and evolving us and then sustaining that evolution and then nourishing that evolution. That's a rub. All of the rest of these people are robbers. They're not rub, they are robbers. They call them robber barons because they leave you empty. <laughs> That's what baron means in another sense, B-A-R-R-E-N, as opposed to their B-A-R-O-N. So let him work righteousness. Now, what word are they translating as righteousness? Amalan salihan. Now look at this very carefully. amalan salihan. Let them work righteousness. Yes, it's work, but salih is not just work. Salih is work that you put your conscious attention to. See, there are things that human beings can do where the conscious mind hardly enters into the equation. How many times have you blinked since we've been online? How many times have you swallowed since you've been online? How many times have you scratched an itch? You, can, you have no clue because those things are not being done by your conscious mind. They're being done based on your subconscious mind. And then there are other activities taking place in the body that are being done by your unconscious mind, such as the beating of your heart and the blood flow through your veins and, you know, the dilating of the pupil and that kind of thing. You have no clue when that's happening to you because it's not being regulated by your chief inspector called the conscious brain, the neocortex. It has nothing to do with neocortex involvement. 
Amel has to do with neocortex involvement. See, fitl has to do with the other stuff. What's going on on the emotional level that you're not really tapped into quite, you know, that you have to go to a shrink to figure out, you know, that kind of stuff. That's fitl, fa'ala, fitl. That's that action. But the action that is relegated to conscious thinking and decision making is amel. So when Allah says, Whoever expects to meet the one who is growing him and her up, <laughs> let that person work the amal. See, let that person work with conscious intent to do right, to do good, to be fair, to be honest, to be just, etc., based on conscious attention to those actions. That is such a beautiful thing when you understand it. All right. So that's what they're calling righteousness. The typical Arabic word is bir, B-I-R-R, -R, bir for righteousness. But this is not talking about that level of righteousness. This is talking about conscious attention to doing good. And what kind of good? Amalan salihan. Now look at this word salihan. It's all throughout the Quran. It not only means good works, righteous deeds is talking about works that serve the purpose of reconciling differences. You see that? It has to be works that are consciously looking for, paying attention to, and attempting to address areas of the human life that Allah intended to be together. But for some reason, the sophisticated you-know-who guy, Shaitani Rajim, decided to break those natural bonds away from each other, to snatch the man away from the woman, snatch the husband away from the wife, even separate the generations by making the children think that there's some foreign creatures to the parents. <laughs> their parents, they're from another world, man. We live in our world, you know, and they have done a, a, a bang up job of separating even the generations that Allah intended to be together. So what does Allah say about that togetherness, that natural proclivity to want to be united that human beings have been created with? Allah says, cursed are those who break asunder that which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has ordered to be joined together, see? So they are natural bonds of relationship that have very little to do with what skin tone you have or what geography you were born in. I believe it was uh, Malcolm X or one of those others who said that because you're born in an oven, it doesn't make you a biscuit. <laughs> All right. So I'm going to use that analogy to say that uh, because you're born in Africa or in Asia or in some part of Europe or in the islands or something, it doesn't make you not human. Wherever you're born, you're born as a human, as a basher. You're born in a category that allows you to express yourself on the human level. We're going to talk about that word in more depth in a moment. But this is what we're talking about when we're talking about human life. That's what the Quran came to address. Not religious life per se. It came to address that which religion is supposed to be addressing. And that is your true human life. That's what the word of Muslim actually means. You'll see that momentarily. So that's Amal and Salihan. So understand that. And the best case provision for keeping and reconciling those differences and keeping those differences reconciled is that you admit no one hmm, as partner, that you do not become mushrik, a person practicing what is called the shirk, meaning the conscious, see, it has to be conscious the conscious association of other things in creation with the one who created them. That would be Allah. You can have partners in creation all you want. You started a business, you got a business partner, that's fine. You get married, you have a spousal partner, that's fine. But when you begin to say that something in creation can partner itself up with the source creator, you have stepped beyond the threshold of the outer limits. And that is punishable because you did it with conscious intent. 
It's not talking about those ignorant Christians and people who just uh, by mistake and don't really know any better say Jesus is God or Jesus is the son of God. That's not the true mushrik. The true mushrik are the ones sitting at the top of that hill who are regulating the world like puppets by saying, if we increase the momentum in this thing that gets them to worship other than Allah, then we'll be right at the front of that gate when we open that door so that instead of worshiping their source creator, they will in effect be worshiping us. Those are the ones that Allah is after. Let's continue. Now, this term man, M-A-N, equals mind, as we said earlier, and it means that which reflects light. That's what the word man meant in its origin, M-A-N. And believe it or not, even that English word is from the Quranic Arabic word man. Allah says, man fi samawati wa man fi ard. And they translate it as whoever is in the skies and whoever is in the earth. In another place, Allah says, ma fi samawati wa ma fi ard. So what does ma mean as opposed to man? Ma means whatever is in the skies and whatever is in the earth. Now, how does that differentiate between man fi samawati? Man fi samawati has to do with living forms that are given to sentience, the ability to make decisions. So Allah told us 1500 years ago that there's life out there. You waiting for scientist Big Head Yaqub to confirm that for you. You don't have to. Allah says, whatever and whoever is out there. Allah is letting you know there's a whoever out there. Life forms that can think is what man means. Man means that which reflects information, that which has information, that which reflects light, metaphorically speaking. You even see it in the word moon that carries the same M N connection as consonants. The moon is that which reflects the light of the bigger body called the sun. So that's what man is doing. The mind is reflecting the bigger body of information called social information and even revelation. That's a bigger body of light than what you can manage as an individual. And the individual you has to depend explicitly upon the larger body of light, just like the moon has to depend on the larger body called the SUN in the universe in order for its little light <laughs> to be lit. So man means mind, and it means that which reflects light. And min is even an ancient word in a couple of languages for the moon. And you can even see the consonants M and N in the word mind. Thoughts for thinkers. Now let's go through these words again that we mentioned earlier, just to see the broader connections. This word ins, as I mentioned, is referring to the instinctive man. Now we're talking about growth and development over many, many millennia of how human beings were established by Allah in the earth as thinkers. That's the ultimate objective, to get you to be a thinker because thinking, as Allah says, profits the thinker. It's called a dhikr in the Quran, reflecting, remembering, putting the members back together. You remember the piece we spoke about at the beginning, right? When you take your piece and come with my piece, that's remembering. So ins is the instinctive man. And I'm going to introduce you to some code words in English that very sophisticated minds understand the connections to, but that you're never taught in public or private school, what I'm about to tell you. You have to listen very carefully to English words. English is a concocted language. It's an invented language, and it was invented specifically to hide wisdom from knucklehead common people as they see us just to hide the wisdom from right in front of your face. Yeah, we told you what we were saying. It's right there in the word. <laughs> you are made of internal stink, you instinctive you. So instinctive means internal stink. 
And it also means internal stick or prodding. There's something in the human makeup in its initial stages of development that serves to poke and prod that human being. You wanna know what I'm talking about? Study the infant. The infant is that instinctive you in its nascent origins. The baby is born almost purely instinctive. You don't have to teach that baby where to go for milk. You don't have to teach that baby how to suck on mama's nipple. You don't have to teach that baby to cry when it's uncomfortable. You don't have to teach the human being these things. We know these things at birth. We know these things instinctively. Be through what's called instinct, just something that Allah clocked into the genetics of human nature to know these things without being taught by a human. So we're born with reams and reams and reams of information <coughs> clocked into our genes. <coughs> clocked into our genes. And we don't need to be taught, but the things we need in order to navigate the environment, <coughs> pardon me, those are things that we need to be taught because they will be responsible for our developing intellect. See, intelligence, you're born with that in your genes. The word intelligent means the internal telling coming from the gents or the genes. <coughs> pardon me. <clears throat> I've been literally, literally teaching all day long, starting with Dr. Omar Zaid. <clears throat> Wonderful intellect. All right. <clears throat> so <clears throat> just a little tickle in the back of the throat. We'll be all right. <clears throat> Pardon me. So we're talking about the internal nature that prods the human being to investigate, that prods the human mind to move in a particular direction. That's why the shepherd prods the sheep and prods the cattle to go in a particular direction. They're being goaded in a particular direction. That nature is in the human being. And Allah says that he created the human being Hama'an Masnoon. Hama'an Masnoon. And they have translated that as dark fetid or dark stinky mud fashioned into shape. So they understand that the human being is born <coughs> instinctively or with an internal stink. They understand that. That's why they translated it that way. <laughs> dark stinky mud fashioned into shape. <clears throat> <clears throat> and the fashioned into shape part is the word masanoon. I just need to swallow. <clears throat> All right. <clears throat> Alhamdulillah. Masanoon is also from a word that gives us the word sunnah. These are the connections that you need to be learning at your average masjid. When Allah says he created the human being, <clears throat> it means that he created every individual with his and her own personalized sunnah. So sunnah is not the sole property of prophets. Sunnah is the property, the generic property of every human being born. Isn't that wonderful to know? That's a wonderful thing to know. So that's ints, the initial stages of our human development. <clears throat> I'm going to excuse myself because I need water instead of what I'm drinking here. So give me just one moment, be right back. And someone please remind me to restart the recording as soon as I get back. Uh, yes, sir. All right.
All right, we're back on the block. Can you hear me loudly and clearly? Yep, I'm clear. I heard you. recording. Okay, we're recording. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to use that as a teaching moment to show you what Allah was trying to show me. Because before I sat down to do this webinar, my intuitive mind said, don't drink coffee. It has creamer in it. And you're just getting mm -hmm. over a cold where your throat has been affected. But that mind that thinks it's the boss said, ah, it's not going to bother me. <laughs> <laughs> and my Rob, the one responsible for my growth and development said, I'll teach him. <laughs> Praise be to Allah. <laughs> and that's how it works. Allah says in the skies, there are ayat, in the earth, there are ayat, and in you, like ayat, but most people pay them no mind whatsoever. When you don't pay them mind, these are the kinds of things that happen, because everything happens for a reason. So we thank Allah. <clears throat> Second again. Plain water will suffice. Alhamdulillah, thank Allah for his life lessons. Let's continue. All right. Okay. Now, <clears throat> we spoke about ints. Uh, now we're going to speak about nas. And you notice I've underlined the letter N and S in each one of these terms. That's where your focus should be. That's what ties them all together. The letter nun and the letter sin. In English, we'd simply say N and S. So Nas represents the intuitive man. And we usually speak about intuition in terms of the nose. Something smells fishy in here. There's no fish. We're talking intuitively. Hmm? The intuition. We like to say the nose knows. Because that's a knowledge that human beings come into without the aid of scholarship, literary assistance, you didn't read it in a book. You just know certain things. You know certain things. Hmm? You know, uh, base knowledge is knowledge, as I said earlier, that has been clocked into our genetics by Allah, the DNA. They say that if you were to take one gene and unpack it, that it could stretch from here to the moon and back. And then someone recently told me that so many times over, it can do that from here to the moon. Just one, one DNA, just from here to the moon and back. That's how much information is contained in one strand. Just one DNA strand. Can you imagine? Who else could do that but a source creator? <clears throat> so the nose is indicative of intuition intuition and you can hear the comparative similarity in the word nas and nose two different languages arabic nas english nose english word nascent or nascent or nose scent do you think they put those two words together for no reason they understand, Muslims, what you have long forgotten because of your extreme attachment to ritualistic life. You think the rituals are all there is to the deen. Somebody fooled you about 1,200 years ago into believing that if you just make a certain amount of rakahs and a certain amount of salat, salawat and a certain amount of this, that, and a certain amount of dhikr, that you're going straight to paradise, you're going to be sorely mistaken. Because according to the Quran, you don't get to that Jannah unless you've been doing some amal, <laughs> some amilu salihat, <laughs> not just some actions that are ritualistic. No, Allah never said that you can do a certain amount of things a certain number of times, like a hundred dhikr, a hundred uh, five salawat a day and uh, for however many years. And Allah doesn't do those kinds of mathematics in the Quran to, to, to guarantee you uh, paradise? No, Allah tells you very clearly, it's the one who does conscious deeds, conscious acts of righteousness, justice, fair dealing amongst people. 
Those are the people who make it to Jannah, not the ritualistic people who are counting every zikr on their phalanges. That's not, that's not where in the Quran. But it's in the Hadith, brother. Let me repeat myself. That's nowhere in the Quran. So you better decide who and what you're going to follow from this point on. The book that's going to deliver you into Jannah, inshallah, or the book that's going to deliver you into the big banker's pockets because you're not paying attention. And your human life would have been sapped of all of its resources, unfortunately. Let's continue. So nas, nascent man, nascent man, man in his origins, man who is connected to his and her original descent. You see that word? Here is nascent or nose scent or nascent. Here is descent. D means to take away something, decentralized government, etc. So what are you taking away? You're taking away the scent. The human being is born with a scent. We love smelling newborn babies once they're all cleaned up, mm -hmm. made all fresh, you know, as soon as you pick that little infant up, you, oh boy, this baby smells so good, right? Yeah, until it poops in its diaper. Then you have to descent it again until it wets its diaper, stays on too long. You walk into the room and go, whoa, you know, this baby's diaper needs to be changed. You have to descent original life when it comes to humans. A cat will lick her kittens clean. So will a dog lick its puppies clean. The human being has to watch and wash and because we need to be descented. But what this is also saying is that there's a need to remove something in human developmental history that represents a sort of uh, smelly situation for humans. In the process of human beings getting to know each other around the world, we begin to do things that may become offensive to other human beings. A population that might be living in a colder climate and they're used to fully covering themselves they might become offended if meeting up with a population of people who live in 100 degree heat on a, almost a daily basis from some other continent. And they're wearing just about just enough to cover nipples and midse midsection or, or uh, you know, pubic hair. You know, they, you know what I'm talking about. And they're just as happy as can be. They have a tribal hunting and fishing and they're not paying attention. They're not oversexed people like those people here in the West. <laughs> this is their fitra. <laughs> The people of the Amazon, you know, they're going bare-breasted. They're not, they're not thinking nasty thoughts. That's our minds that are not used to that, that are thinking, wow, if I could just live there for a week. <laughs> You'd have a paternity suit if I know you. <laughs> anyway, moving right along. <clears throat> Nas represents those people who are in the process of evolution where many of the more offensive kinds of behavior, the offensive thoughts because of their lack of knowledge pertaining to other people. Allah says that he created us as tribes and nations that we might acknowledge each other, that uh, the word is ta'araf, li ta'arafu from Arafat, that we may at least acknowledge each other's surface contributions. Arafat, that which is existing as excellence, but on the surface levels of things. So we're not to look at somebody else in a grass skirt and say, that's primitive, that's nasty, that's, no, that's their contribution to humanity until and unless they decide to improve upon their excellence. Allah made that their purview. He didn't make it so other people should come over there and enforce their cultural ways and their cultural mores on a different people who are not raised like that. This is all a part of the development of human excellence, person to person, people to people. This is how we grow. So in San, moving up the ladder, is the moral thinking man. Inshallah, we're going to go about another 15 minutes. We should be through by 8.30. In San is the moral thinking man. That's happening in the neocortex. NAS is happening in the emotional brain called the mammalian brain, the midbrain. 
Ints is happening in the instinctive brain called the reptilian brain. You see how this goes now? It goes from the reptilian brain, ints, and it evolves up to the emotional brain called limbic or mammalian brain, the midbrain. And then it evolves even further into the development of the neocortex, which is the thinking brain, the more rational brain. That's inside. And that is where intuition becomes subdued in favor of the moral mind's development, which bases itself on knowledge, not emotions. It bases itself on insight, not just feelings about things. It looks past the surface forms of things into the functionality of the thing. That is when the mind grows into true observation of Allah's fitra. You may remember me saying that fitra is a combination of form and function. Not only how a thing looks on the surface, but how a thing actually operates functionally beneath the surface. Behind the face of the clock, there's functionality. The face of the clock, the average child can draw that. But ask that same child to draw what's happening with those gadgets and mechanisms behind the face of the clock that's causing the clock to do what it does. The average child, the average adult can't tell you that or can't draw that for you as a schematic. Mm -hmm. So that's the fit draw. How we look as people, so-called black man, so-called white man, so-called Indian man, so-called Spanish man, so that's all form. And the world of social schemas have us absolutely preoccupied with form, just one aspect of the fit draw. But we're supposed to marry that aspect of the fitra with how we function. And that's where we have fallen short because of the schemes of Ashtetan and Rajim. His schemes are what have kept us away from understanding ourselves on the level of how we function, humanly speaking. How do I know that? And where's my proof? My proof is that if you ask the average person who will die, that is a doornail. <laughs> behind the idea that they are human. You call them something other than human, they're ready to fight you. But then ask them behind that, well, what exactly does the word human mean? Uh, 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 where did it come from? Uh, uh, what does human mean? Uh, uh, what does man mean? Uh, uh, blah, 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 right? That's the average person I'm talking about. College professors can't tell you that on the most part. What the word human means and where did it come from? And how does that apply to you as a functional being? Not just in your form. Don't tell me head, two arms, two legs, like the 5% strat, you know, I'm God. You know, God has a head, two arms, two legs. You know, so does a monkey, man. Come on, give me a break. That's not what it's talking about. It's talking about how you function. Let's try to get to that before the night is over. So that's insane. It's when intuition becomes subdued in favor of the moral mind's development, which bases itself on knowledge or insight that looks past the surface form and into the functionality. The majority of humans on this planet right now are dysfunctional because they've never been taught how a human is supposed to function. The high levels of suicide, high levels of depression, high levels of emotional insanity in the world now because they have intentionally kept from us the proper knowledge of how we function, humanly speaking. The Quran has been delivered to humanity in order to revitalize, revive, and retain, uh, retain and return the knowledge of that excellence for human beings worldwide, not just in Mecca, not just in Medina, worldwide acknowledgement of that excellence. Now, what is this term jinn that gets bandered about? And now I'm coming strictly from Imam W.D. Muhammad's language and logic. He said that the jinn represent our passions that are unchecked by knowledge. Let me repeat that. Jinn is not some spooky spirit that's waiting to get into your bathroom to scare you half to death at two in the morning when you got to go take a piss. Excuse the expression. That's not what jinn is referring to. Jinn represents your base level passions. When unchecked 
by knowledge. And by knowledge, we mean morality-based knowledge. Morality-based knowledge. Let's continue. In Surah 38, IS 76, the Quran says, Qala ana khayrun minhu, khalaqta ni min narin, wa khalaqta hu min tini. Iblis said, I am better than him. Thou createst me from nar, from fire, and him thou createst from thin, clay. Yusuf Ali translation. The Quranic Arabic word nar means fire. The Quranic Arabic word thin means soft, shapeable clay. I want this to register deep in your cerebral hemisphere. <laughs> Repeating, the Quranic word narn means fire. The Quranic Arabic word thin means soft, shapeable, malleable clay. It goes on to say, pardon me, this is the same IS, ah, yeah, so we'll, we'll push past that. The Quran goes on to say, <laughs> He created man from what's called the sounding clay, salsal, sounding clay, like unto pottery, kel. Fakhari. Kal means like unto. Fakhar. Pottery, meaning hardened clay. We're making our case. Stand by. That's hardened clay. Now, when this clay was soft and impressionable is when they began to make these drawings and these writings. When the clay became dried clay, then whatever etchings were impressed into the clay became pretty much permanent. We're talking about human nature and how Allah created this human nature. He created it from malleable, fresh, shapeable clay to begin with. But he also created this human being from sel sel dried clay, similar to pottery. What makes the difference? Moisture. In a word, what makes the difference between thin as soft clay, impressionable clay, and salsal as hardened expressive clay, expressing its picture, its shape. The only difference is that the salsal has been dried of all of its moisture. This is speaking to human nature like no other picture I can paint right now. Because the word human means humus man or humus mind. And humus means that which contains moisture. Oh, we're having such a jolly time right now. Let me push forward. <laughs> you go get yourself a cup of coffee. No, don't do that. It's too late for that. <laughs> I'm not going to keep you that much longer, I promise. So Salsal is clay which hardens. I'm coming specifically out of the series, volume one of the Ramadan sessions that were given by Imam W.D. Muhammad from uh, 1983 until 1991. That's what we'll be dealing with in the next uh, few weeks, in case you're not familiar with this language. Most of this is from the tafsir of Imam Warathuddin Muhammad commenting on these Quranic verses. So Salasala, once again, clay which hardens. kal molded clay that is formed into a particular shape. This is in reference to how human personalities form in the world. When they are young and impressionable, especially between born day and seven years old, when the human child's mind is like, literally like a tape recorder, just taking in from the five, through the five senses, taking in, taking in, storing in the memory bank. Hmm? That's the teen stage. When the baby or the child then, the teenager and the young adult begins to give you back what you gave it, that's the cell cell. That's when the personality has been formed into a particular shape, an identifiable shape. 
Imam Muhammad said that Satan's role is to slay the clay. That's for your back pocket. Satan's role is he, he can't leave the clay alone. His job, he sees it, is to slay the clay. The English word slay means both sacred lay. That S on the beginning means sacred. But the S on the beginning can also mean secret. Just like the S on the beginning of sword, S-W-O-R-D can mean sacred word or it can mean secret word. And both swords are used in this world, one by the righteous, one by the wicked. So likewise, the English word slay carries that same coded letter inference. It means sacred lay as well as secret lay. And lay is just another word for intercourse. Don't see that as being nasty. Just follow the bouncing ball. No pun intended, <laughs> right? Lay, if you look it up in an English dictionary, it means sex or intercourse, but it's not talking about physical sex between two physical beings, male and female. Is talking about the intercourse of frequencies, the intercoursing of ideas, the intercoursing involved in the exchange of knowledge and principles, etc., that give birth to other things. So Satan is able to slip into the human life due to his ability to insert his seed into the impressionable psyches. That's the moist clay we're talking about now. The impressionable human psyches, the emotional uh, divide, the emotional midbrain, the limbic brain, the mammalian brain, that emotional center. They know how to slip their words, their language, their frequencies into your middle brain. What does Allah say in the Quran? And guard the salat usta, the middle salat. You think it's talking about some ritual out in the middle of somewhere, and it's not. It's talking about the middle stage of development within your own brain's development. That's one of many, many layers of meanings that that particular ayah is speaking to. So Satan wants to insert his seed into the impressionable psyches, especially of our younger people, but of the masses in general. For what purpose? In order to produce his intended results. Now, according to one of Imam W.D. Muhammad's early lectures, when the Bible and the Quran speak about adultery, it is speaking about the illegal commingling of Satan's scheme with the susceptible public mind. So when Satan puts certain frequencies out into the atmosphere, out into the environment, when those frequencies come upon innocent intellects that are just exploring, just attempting to learn what the world is about, and they come into contact with those frequencies from shaitan, and those frequencies begin to influence that intellect to think in a certain direction, to calculate responses in a particular way and to execute those responses. If those responses are directly the result of Satan's influence, then that's what the Bible and the Quran call adultery. Zina, adultery in the Quran, in the Bible, adultery. Imam Muhammad said that physical adultery between a man and his wife or whoever's fooling around him, he said human beings know how, they've been dealing with that for thousands of years. You don't need revelation to address that but you need a, a revelation to address this scheme, this adultery. So it is done via the manipulation of knowledge, which has been designed to appeal to the lower passions of people. See, that's how you know Satan's hand has been throwing the bow and the spear and the bullet, because what comes at you begins to operate on the level of your lower passions, it begins to knock on the door of your lower regions and ask, is there anyone there who can come out to play? That's how you know the difference. 
Allah's revelation is knocking on the doors of your higher self, your higher aspirations, your higher possibilities, your excellence. Satan's knock on the door is always going to be knocking on the door of your lower expectations of yourself, how you see yourself, how you see other people as being, as Iblis said, I am better than him. See, that's your lower passions knocking to say, come out and play, but just understand that my family is better than yours. My race, better than yours. My economics, better than yours. See, it's always Hayrun Minhu, that I am better in every category than that. He didn't even call his name. He just said Minhu, then it. <laughs> Let's continue. Now, in Surah Ar-Rahman, Surah 55, Ayah 15, look at what Allah says. This is beautiful. And I'm sorry that I'm going over time, but this is so important. Allah says, And he created jinns from fire free of smoke. Now, listen to what Imam Muhammad had to say about these words. The Quranic Arabic word marijin means streaming fire, i.e. free. Take free of smoke. Not the best translation, but we'll let Yusuf get away with that for now. Because our concentration is on the marijin, which means streaming from the fire, the streams coming from the fire. Interesting that we call our cable television and our internet and all of that, we call that streaming information also, don't we? You think it's not related? It is. Those are other forms of streaming fire because those things are meant to burn you up if you give in to them, those messages. Let's continue. So margin indicates not being hampered or restricted. Another way of phrasing it is that the fire has no checks. See, it has no checks on it. The nature of our human primordial passions fits this description perfectly. It represents passions that are burning with no resistance. Every baby is born into this nature of uncontrollable passions, which do not abate until the appetite of, uh, or the difficulty has subsided. Hmm? These passions that the average infant is born with, they do not abate. They do not die down until the appetite that's causing that outrage, feed me, feed me, huh? or whatever the difficulty is, I'm wet. It remains until those difficulties and those appetites have been abated or satisfied. So what is this saying? It's saying something that Imam Muhammad said in 1975 when he first became the main teacher in the community of his father, Elijah Muhammad. He said that every infant is born with the jinn nature and also that every primordial people prior to receiving revelation are also born as the jinn type. And that's why the historical Jew, the knowledgeable Jew, has called the European, generally speaking, Gentile. That means gin-like. They went into Europe. They began to study the behavioral characteristics of the typical European. And they said, that person hasn't received revelation. That person is not in touch with God. That person is not in touch with their source creator. They're still operating based on base passions and lusts, <laughs> pulling their women by the hair and indiscriminate sex sometimes with animals. You know, this is how a particular people saw the typical European. So they said, well, those people are jinni. Hmm? They're jinni. And they are here. We're going to design these people in order to satisfy our requests. And that's where the whole idea of genies come from. <laughs> jinni, genie in the bottle. They have to be kept Corral. Now they have to be kept in the bottle until we want them to come out. And then we do what? Masaha. He rubbed the thing. So you rub the masa. That's where Messiah comes from. You want your own personal Messiah? Keep them locked up until you need them. And then 
make a wish foundation has to kick in, right? Make a wish and let him come out. And as soon as he's finished granting your wishes, put that sucker back in the bottle. And that's how many of the European nations have been treated by those who sit behind the curtain orchestrating their behaviors. Subject for another day, let's continue. Fire, although it can be put out, it resists being managed. You have to lock fire up behind a fireplace, which itself is made from what? Hardened clay or what we're calling stone. Fear the fire whose fuel is men and stone, echoing in the background of my mind right now. Jinn and men are behavioral characteristics of human creatures, so says W.D. Muhammad. Jinn and men, meaning nas, that's the term being given for when jinn is mentioned in cooperation with humans. It's jinn and nas, men. These are behavioral characteristics of human creatures. And when we say behavior, we're talking about the emotional center of the mind. That which be having emotional attitudes and dispositions, see? Behavior. The word behavior is actually the word behavior. And behavior is speaking to the word have. Have is speaking to the idea of possessing something. And wanting to possess something is a byproduct of the emotional mind. It's your emotions that want to have things. I need a newer car than the one I bought last year. I need a bigger house than the one I purchased three years ago. I need a bigger woman than the one I had as my girlfriend, you know, however many, probably days ago, the way it's crazy world, right? But the whole idea is that I have to have it. And what's instigating that desire to have, desire to have is the emotional nature. So where does this word have come from? It comes out of the Semitic language. In Arabic, the word have would be Hawa, the so-called wife of Adam. In Hebrew, it would be Heva, which is where they get the word Eve, as in the wife of the biblical Adam. Where is she on the scale? She's in between Adam and the serpent. She's right in the middle. She's Eve in even. She's level. Take the two L's off. What do you have? Eve. She's right in the middle. And guard Salatu Usta. I hope y'all are understanding this. Guard the middle Salah. And Allah guarded the middle person called Eve in the Bible, he guarded her in the Quran by not even mentioning her name. <laughs> he said, take her out of the picture. Too many arrows and bullets are being shot in her direction, meaning in the direction of human emotionality. So Allah takes human emotionality out of the picture in the Quran so that it doesn't become a, a target hmm? for people of lower interests and values. Allah puts the elevated emotionality in the Quran. And Allah gives us strategies as to how to deal with that wayward emotionality in that Surah 4, where he speaks about what people have misinterpreted as the beating of the women. The men are the maintainers and the providers and the supervisors. And some would add the dictators over the women. That's not what that say. Ari Jalun is that neocortex, that thinking moral brain, that moral thinking brain. And Allah says that Ari Jalu Kawamuna is the supervisor, yes, but the one who is establishing standards. See, Kawamuna from the same root as Qiyam and Qama that we spoke about earlier. It's that neocortex, moral, rational brain that is establishing the standards. Upon what? 
It didn't say for women. It said upon. So that means that anisa is a lower strata of what's happening in the human mind. What is that lower strata that is lower than the thinking brain? Once again, the emotional brain. That's what is being referred to now as anisa. Think about what I'm saying. The thinking brain is to have precedence and leadership and decision-making capabilities over the emotional brain. And when the emotional brain becomes disobedient to the point where it begins to wreak havoc, then the neocortex brain, Arigel, the male, so to speak, has to then go through certain step-by-step -step measures to bring that emotional brain back into conformity. That's all it's talking about. I'm gonna give a whole class on this in another couple of weeks. So we can relieve the female of that unnatural artificial burden that unfortunately our Muslim men have put them under. Alhamdulillah. Indeed. Now that's the kind of expression and feedback I like to hear. <laughs> because you know how badly that's needed in the Muslim world. Now. So this fire, although it can be put out, it resists being managed. When you see people, especially in the form of your children who just don't like for you to tell them what to do, or in the classroom, the student just doesn't like for you to tell them what to do, that's gin operating. That's refusing management, refusing discipline refusing to cooperate. That's what fire does. It refuses to cooperate. You say to it all yourself, you say to it all, all, all for, for minutes at a time and an hour. Don't do that. Don't rage all out of control. Keep talking that and not trying to put that fire out and see where that fire ends up an hour from now. You'll be your house, your neighbor's house. And in the case of Chicago, the entire city. <laughs> all right. The Chicago fire. Some of you remember that. Now, you have to lock fire up behind a fireplace, which itself, as I said, is made from hardened clay. Huh? When you lock a criminal up, Imam Muhammad said, you put them behind stone, don't you? In fact, you used to have them busting up stones. See, all of that is symbolic. Jinn and men, as I said, are behavioral characteristics of human creatures. The jinn nature in its expression of immaturity refuses to accept a creator. Now we're getting to the nitty gritty of the situation. The jinn in its expression of immaturity, it refuses to accept a creator. It knows that there's a creator, but it refuses to accept the authority of that creator. Wasn't that Iblis? He referred to Allah as Rabbi, my, my Rabb, my, my, my Lord, my creator, my Eva. But did he follow what Allah was telling him to do? No. Hmm? And due to that, the jinn, for that reason, has not been chosen by Allah to represent the office of Khalifa. Now, although clay hardens, it can also shatter. That hardened clay is represented in men of dry and cold logic. You ever feel a stone that's been out in the atmosphere for days at a time? Put your hand to it, more than likely it's going to be cold. Dry, if it hasn't rained, and cold. That's a reference to the logic the logic that humans can become reduced to utilizing. Soft clay is the same as soft skin called the bashar in the Quran and in the Arabic language. Soft clay, if you push on it, it can become impressed. Sometimes you can press on it in a very hard way, let your thumb go and you can still see, see the imprint, the imprint in your skin because that soft clay is indicative of your soft bashar nature. Soft clay is the same as soft skin. And when it hardens, it becomes insensitive. Like when you get a callus, a callus. 
And if you do not have the right sensitivity is the point, you will not receive correct knowledge. Let me repeat that. These are words coming directly off of the pages and out of the mouth of W.D. Muhammad. In 1983, by the way, if you do not have the right sensitivity as a human I'm talking about, you will not receive correct knowledge. Look at the world of so-called white people right now. Now, I'm not casting aspersions. I'm making a point. Because so many Europeans and European Americans have been duped by a whole other people that we won't discuss right now. They have been duped into believing in faulty information when it comes to their own identity. White God, white son of God, white angels. Everybody else in the world has been left out of the picture except the so-called white people. And that wasn't all their fault. Now they were corralled and seduced actually into that mindset when they were just running around as little gin in Europe, in the caves and places in Europe. That's when that scheme began to be impressed upon their soft clay. But because they had lived under the misperceptions of self and others for all of these hundreds of years we're talking about now, not just a few decades, we're talking hundreds of years. White supremacy under that idea was in the world for at least the past 5,000 years old beginning in India. That's what created the caste system of India. Indo-Europeans and Nordics coming from the north into the hot belt of India and reinterpreting their color symbolism among the Vedics, that scripture. They began to reinterpret so that children of the light no longer meant children of knowledge. Children of the dark no longer meant children of ignorance. Children of the light was retranslated to mean children of white or light skin were close to God. Not the enlightened people were close to God, but the light-skinned people were now the closest ones and favored of God. And the dark-skinned Dasisas people became the untouchables of India. They were the darkest, the blackest, the ones who they were encouraged not to even be in physical contact with. Does that sound familiar with? You, you think your social distancing was something? If you had lived, in fact, it's still going on today. So just go visit that section of the Indian continent or a country that uh, believes in uh, the caste system. 5,000 years old, they haven't been able to get rid of it yet. And it's what gave birth to the modern day Ku Klux Klan mind. So that's what I mean. And because that mind was devoid of proper human sensitivity, that mind amongst the people who continue generation after generation after generation to accept that lie, that mind became desensitized to human values and human concerns. And you see it manifest right now in the American government and everybody else who's standing up upon that platform of white is right, masquerading it as Black Lives Matter, but it's still saying white is right, we have to be your guardian. You can't fend for yourself. We have to speak for you because you're not intelligent enough to vote. You're not intelligent enough to make a cogent decision. You're not intelligent enough to run your own communities and your own affairs. We have to run it for you. That's the result. That's the offshoot of that mentality. It has caused a callus to form over many so-called white people's brains. So again, if you don't have the proper sensitivity, you're not going to have the proper knowledge is the point. And your brain will begin to spin out of control. That's what you see happening now. Clearly in the public amongst these so-called politicians, these economists and these other people who are calling themselves the leaders of your world. They're not the leader of my world. They call themselves the leaders of your world. And it's your choice whether you wanna continue putting them in the front of the line with their blindfolds on and saying, lead me to salvation. Now, each cell in the body is protected by an outer skin. We're talking about basher, meaning human skin, human sensitivity, so pay attention. Each cell is protected by an outer skin membrane, 
which is sensitive to all things which represent a threat or a danger to the cell's existence. Listen carefully. We're going back into consonantal connections now. So whatever I say that is related to the word cell with its S L sound, even though it's a C, it's an S L sound, cell. You can take it and apply it to any other word you know in any other language that has the S L sound and connection. So you can take it to the other English word, soul, S O U L. S L is all you need. Cell. Soul. So what is that cell? It contains an outer skin called a membrane. Membrane. Won't go into that today, but obviously it has a meaning. Hmm? Mem, if you didn't know, means water in Hebrew. It's a Hebrew letter, like our letter meme, and both of them mean water. Beautiful connections in the logic once you understand it. And it's easy. You can teach this to your grandchildren. So the cell is going to operate in the same way that the soul operates. They're going to have similarities because they are consonantally connected. Let's look at another important Arabic Quranic term, salah. You hear the SL connection in salah? It's going to operate along the same logic as the cell and the soul. So if the cell has an outer skin membrane, which protects it from outside invasion, that means that the soul is going to also have an outer covering that protects it from invasion. And that also means that whatever salah means, it's also going to have something outside of itself that is protecting it from outside invasion. It's so beautiful when you understand it. Continuing. When our intelligence becomes separated from our sensitivities, the intellect can then no longer perceive the external world correctly. W.D. Muhammad's language and logic. When the intelligence, and remember now, the intelligence is that knowledge operating innately within your genes within your DNA, that's your intelligence. The intellect is something different. The intellect is what's happening through the accumulation of environmental information going into the brain, registering in the neocortex and in the emotional brain, right? But what's happening within the core life, operating within your instinctive drives that are being controlled by your genetics, when that life becomes separated from your sensitivities, in other words, in your core instincts, there is the desire to eat. What happens when that desire is interrupted? What happens when that desire is deadened in you? Then you cease to want to live. You see how that works? When the intelligence becomes separated from proper sensitivities, the intelligence says, I'm born in a family structure. I love my mother, I love my father, my grandparents. I love for auntie and uncle to visit us and all that. And we all big hugs and kisses when they come over for Thanksgiving or for whatever holiday or whatever. Now, what happens when an artificial influence sneaks into that and says, you should no longer hug your grandmother because you might get it, you get it? And now you have something operating in the intellect that is counter the proclivities that Allah clocked into your intelligence. Your intelligence is what is responsible for science referring to you as a gregarious creature, a creature who has to socialize or die. <laughs> That's why the worst punishment is isolation in prison. Mm -hmm. You could just be left alone and be given three meals a day and a cot and all of that, and, but no socialization. You will die right there. They've done that experiment, unfortunately, with newborn infants. They took 10 infants in some city USA, and they decided to experiment on them by making sure that they were well fed, but mechanically, not with any arms or hands touching them, no hugs, no kisses, just mechanical feeding, changing of the diapers, all of that happened mechanically. And in less than a couple of weeks, every single one of the 10 human infants died. 
from lack of socialization, from lack of touch. Major science we're discussing right now, cruel experiment, but it does bring us to a particular point that the human being has to socialize because what? Look at the words again. The soul needs to be social. If the soul becomes anti-social, then the soul will dissipate and die. That's why you have the madness in the world that you have right now, because of the emphasis that they put on social distancing at the beginning of that crisis. And that's a code word for Christ. They know what they're doing. Corona means crown. Didn't they put the crowning touch, the crowning, the finishing touches on Jesus in the Bible by crowning him with a crown of thorns? And it was not long after that, that he so-called gave up the ghost and dropped his head and said, it is finito. And they gave him vinegar and hyssop. Vinegar and hyssop. Amazing. What does hyssop do? It lowers blood pressure. What is blood symbolic of? Your social nature. So what is that saying? They gave Jesus, meaning the masses, the body Christ, us. They gave Jesus vinegar, which cuts the breath. That's the spiritual life being addressed. They created a condition in the masses where they would no longer and could no longer trust spiritual life and information. They said, shut down the churches, shut down the masses, shut down the synagogues. So they cut the breath, the vinegar, and they gave him hyssop. And when they gave him the hyssop is when it is said that he said, it is done, it is finished. And it says that his head dropped. And that's exactly when the intellects of the world dropped, when they gave us the doctrine of social distancing, the hyssop. Now, if that's not perfectly aligned enough for you, Again, you need to find another class to be in. I'm not going to keep trying to convince you of the logic. All of it has already been clearly explained in both books, the Bible and the Quran, with the Quran providing the most clear explanation of what I'm talking about. Where Allah says about Jesus, they neither killed him nor crucified him, but it was made to appear as such. So they can keep on trying to kill the human nature, kill the human social nature. They can do that all they want. Guess what? It's just going to bounce back with more fury. And that's what's happening right now. People are finding a way. They're looking at those on high and they're saying, well, how come they don't follow the same rules that they're putting on us? Why are they fraternizing? Why are they all up in each other's faces? Why is Obama in his house, of, you know, and they're not six feet distancing at his party? But if they come to my house and peek in my window and we're not six feet away from each other. They make grandma leave or they lock up uncle, you know. Well, how come what's good for the goose is not good for the gander? So the human being begins thinking. And then that way Allah begins to regenerate that social nature. Allah says again, cursed are those who break asunder what Allah has ordered to be joined together. That's your social nature but you have to work on its development. You have to work on its management. You have to work on reconnecting the pieces so that the human being's nature will once again become holistic. We were designed to be humus man. That's what human means. It infers moisture content. Humus means that which is given moisture as far as the soil is concerned. You can't grow a thing if soil is not given water or moisture content. If the moisture dissipates, what remains is dry soil. What you're seeing now in the form of politicians and economists and even religious preachers and leaders, you're not seeing moist soil that's growing anything. You're seeing dry souls 
dry soil. The same holds true for soil, that soil that we're now calling the human soul. Everything in the soil is to be metaphysically found in the soul. Look at that easy mathematics that I'm giving you. Just study what's in the soil. You're going to find a metaphysical corresponding logic in the soul. You got to look for it. It doesn't just jump out at you. You have to study and force your brain to make these connections. Yet tadabbaru al-Qur'an, so says Allah. Think deeply, ponder deeply what Allah is saying in the Qur'an if you want to avoid all of the distractions and all of the contradictions. When proper sensitivities or moisture dry up, the sensibilities fail to operate appropriately. Sensitivities, that's in your emotional mind, and sensibilities, that's in your thinking mind. They were designed by our source creator to rule over passions or our base appetites survival instincts, in other words. They do so in order to keep them in check. That's why Allah put the sensitivities and the sensibilities over those baseline instinctive drives, those passions unchecked by knowledge. He did that so that they would be checked in the same way that a stone fireplace has been designed to keep a fire in check. Without the fireplace, the fire can rage all out of control in a fury. Burn down stuff that you never intend. You just wanted to warm up the living room, for God's sake. And here the curtains are now on fire. The couch is caught on fire. You understand? Because you didn't have a stone fireplace in place in order to check the parameters of the fire. Now, the word Muslim, lastly, indicates this activity. It is speaking to the intellect. That's the letter seen. It means intellect as it chews on information, sana, the brightening of the teeth, as it chews on food. Well, the intellect does the same thing as it chews on information, it becomes brighter. We call a child bright. Mm -hmm. So the letter seen means the intellect as it disciplines and regulates, that's the letter lamb, the shepherd's hook. He's disciplining his sheep. He's disciplining and regulating the movement and the activity of the sheep with his lamb, with his shepherd's hook. Just turn it upside down, you got the Arabic letter lamb, right? So look at these two letters. The intellect, when it learns to regulate the emotional nature, that's mean. Mean means water. It represents the churning of the acids in the stomach as it's attempting to digest food. That's emotionality in you attempting to digest higher ideas, understand why things are said the way they're said, understand why you can have this and not that, or why you can have that which you don't want, and you can't have that which you do want, and all of that. That's meme in you, the watery nature, the emotional nature. So salam and muslim and islam and aslama, all of those words that contain the seen, lam, meme, represent that activity regarding the intellect as it disciplines the emotional nature, keeping that fire, and in this case, that acid water content in check. Grasping the knowledge is called a touch, according to Imam Muhammad, see? In the Quran, Allah puts in the mouth of Maryam the words, how can I have a bashir when no, uh, pardon me, how can I have a, a walid, a baby, when no man has touched me? Masaha, no bashir hmm, has touched me. Oh, this is so wonderful when you understand it. <laughs> how can I get that higher life? When no higher being, no higher inspiration has touched me. And touch, once again, implies grasping for knowledge, touching. Reach out and touch somebody's hand. Make this a better world if you can. No man has touched me. Mm. 
touch implies sensitivity based on two things coming into contact with each other. Hmm? If sensitivity is not the end result of two things touching, then at least one of those entities has lost its sensitivity and has become either fire or stone. Now, if my two fingers are touching, but only one hand can feel the sensitivity, but the other can't, it's because this one has become stone. We simply call it callous. And in a human being, callous means humanly insensitive. You get it? So as we engage with each other socially, there are going to be some people who are sensitive to our human concerns, but there are going to be other people who are totally insensitive. You think you're looking at a human being, but in fact, you're looking at gin. <laughs> oh man, or you're looking at somebody who has just decided to divorce themselves from sensitivities altogether. They might not see themselves as being bad people. They see themselves as having to do this thing, whether it hurts people or not, whether it robs people or not, whether it sets people back or not. I have to fulfill this agenda because it's good for the overall cause, you know, the socialist cause or whatever. We had to reduce the world by two fifths, two thirds of a population, you know, or else we're not going to be able to live on this earth and benefit from all of the earth's resources. That's what they're telling us, foolish stuff like that. So fire is given its own or given to its own rage. Fire likes to rage out of control. So that's its rage or what Imam Muhammad called its motivation or its blind urges. Fire has blind, fire doesn't care what it latches onto. It, it wants everything around it to reflect what it is. It's also a symbol of the human ego. It's also a symbol of human opinionism. We want our opinion. We want your opinion to be our opinion. Well, I don't agree with you. Here's how you should see it. See, that's why they say this is how you should see that, because opinion begins with O-P, op, which means how you see optically. See, my opinion is how I want you to see you. Forget your opinion. Adopt my opinion. That's the jinn. They want you to see what they see. All right. The end result of this activity is that the sensibilities become impervious to the needs of things in the surrounding environment. Fire doesn't care what it catches on to as long as what it catches on to is able to reflect its growth. Those who possess no faith, listen, those who possess no faith, no iman, they are not flesh anymore. They have become either jinn, fire, or stone, callous. Basher, that malleable skin, that impressionable skin, that mortal skin, that skin that still has moisture content, just like the moist clay. Basher is the ultimate position that is assumed by the flesh. We're going to go deeper into that idea this time next year. If you look at the letters for Basher in Arabic, and then look at the English word for flesh, this B in Bashar is a labial that interchanges with the F in flesh. Both lip sounds, B, F. Obviously, the SH sound in Bashar interchanges with the SH sound in flesh. And when you understand consonantal connections, you automatically know that the labial, not labial, pardon me, but the liquid letter R where the tongue has to touch the top palate, interchanges with the, lab, uh, with the uh, um, liquid letter, L, where the tongue also has to touch the top palate. Those are the only two letters that interchange in the mouth at that region. The R, where the tongue goes up and trills off the top palate, and the L, where the tongue goes up and magnetizes or sticks to the top palate, L. So Bashar and flesh, I don't know if they designed it like this. I can only say that Allah allowed it to happen so that in this day and time, 2022, a little boy from the projects of New York City, Douglas Houses, would be able to peep their proverbial card. It's the only thing I can figure out. I don't think they had a worldwide plan to lock all their logic up into these consonantal connections. I think Allah designed the human mouth 
so that whatever they schemed word-wise would not escape his greater scheme. Satan schemes and Allah schemes. And Allah is the best of schemers, so says the Quran. Beautiful. Now, when this flesh nature becomes imbued with Allah's ruh, the mind then has access to cosmic frequencies. We're still talking about the Bashar now. Keep that in mind, being the highest expression of human existence, Bashar, that flesh, the flesh that they told you was sinful in other religions. Judaism and Christianity purported that, that man is born in sin and shaped by iniquity. The Quran comes to free the human being from that tyranny. So when the flesh nature becomes imbued with Allah's ruh, the mind then has open access to cosmic frequencies and is then put in a position to rule as Khalifa. So if you want to know what the true Khalifa is, don't look for a political ruler in Iran somewhere. <laughs> look for the human ruler that Allah has created to exist in the human being him and her, who are growing along the dimensions of natural evolution. A Khalifa, as Imam Muhammad said, is the excellent state of the human mind itself. So look at what Allah says in this last ayah. Allah speaking, when I have fashioned him in due proportion, so way to who, from the same uh, root letters as uh, uswa and siwa, hmm? do even balanced proportion. When I have fashioned him in balanced proportion, and then nefertu, hmm? breathe into him of my ruh, hmm? fall ye down in sajda. Forget obeisance. Allah says fall down in sajda in his direction. Isn't that a wonderful thing? So what is that saying in essence? Last word, that this creation that is being fashioned for a position as Allah's Khalifa fil Ard, Khalifa in the earth. This position does not take its rightful throne until Allah has breathed into him of his ruh. When that ruh becomes your personal possession, and that means you and me, not just the prophets. Remember, they tried to tell you that the Wahi was the province of only Muhammad or only the prophets? No, it's the province of any human being who qualifies by disciplining himself and herself for this level of expression. So when that happens, Allah allows for his angels, his agents in the universe, his cosmic forces to begin operating on your behalf. That's why they can write books now like ask and it is given and they give you the science behind how to obtain the halal things of this world the quran gives it to you in simpler language but the bible gives it to you also in the words i just gave you ask and it is given knock and the door shall be opened according to the new testament words spoken by jesus the christ so that same opportunity is open to you and me, folks. It's open to you and I, people. But you have to discipline the spirit. You have to discipline the lower regions of the nature. That ahwa has to be maintained and tamed, that lower desire in you for lower things of the world and becoming satisfied with those lower things of the dunya that Allah calls hayyatu dunya, the life of the dunya, that lower region, playing with fire, you know, that kind of thing, just seeing how long a thing will burn. <laughs> Let's see. Let's throw this friendship into the fire and see how long it'll burn before it starts to smother before it starts to smoke. Let's throw, let's throw this marriage in the fire and see how, long, see how long it takes before I can run and get me another sweetie. I'm tired of this one. I'll throw this one in the fire.
I don't know if it was his business relationship. I'm tired of being his partner. And hey, throw that in the fire. Let me start being untrustworthy. See, so this operates on the level of human interaction is the point, not on the level of some spooky spirits flying around trying to get in your bathroom. On the level of human exchange, human growth and development, human cognition, and human ultimate evolution. I thank all of you for the time and attention that you've paid. I'm not going to answer any of the questions tonight. We're already over time, but I promise you that I will look through them in the email that um, Bayina sends me, and I will do my best to answer them online through an email. Once again, I pray that you enjoy this journey tonight. Inshallah, we'll go into an extension of this based on that same book, and we will explore other Quranic concepts and words and Quranic fitra based letters in the Arabic letter system for better understanding and application of what Allah is saying in his grand Quran. As I greet you in the greetings of peace, reconciliation, and the attempt to become whole and united. Salamun alaikum to you all. Goodness is on the rise. Your brain is becoming activated. Absolutely. And I still have our guest on that they were uh, patient enough to stay with us. It, it, if not, they'll receive the replay also. But thank you for being with us. We've been able to maintain a steady number of 40 and above tonight. So thank you. We'll see you in about a week, inshallah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Please, as far as them seeing it on YouTube or however you're going to do this, because I wasn't able to come through on Zoom. Yes, ma'am. So this will probably be one of the last uh, webinars to be shown publicly. <laughs> Most of the other or the upcoming um, on um, university online learning course classes will be private classes. So you'll, if you're not joined yet officially, then you'll have to join the class. And you can email me at cosmicquran1 at gmail.com, cosmicquran1 at gmail.com for further information as to how to join. But these classes will cease and desist after December. Okay. Uh -huh. so thank you. And if okay. anyone needs to reach me, Bayin, I don't know if you put my phone number, my contact number in the... Uh, messages or not but you can do that before we close out so they'll have oh, that when I email them. oh okay so long okay. all right and, uh, i think that's about all we can handle for tonight so yes do look for this on youtube in another couple of hours it should be Allah. and uh i'll see you yeah. next week peace <laughs> to all salam on alaikum please feel better I do. Uh, I do being in touch with all of your energy i feel almost tip top right now <laughs> thank you all right. Peace.